This is lecture number eight on the chaotic kingdom stage period in Old Testament history. And the first seven lectures we have given over to the history of that period itself as uh, seen through the eyes, or that is to say by a summary, of the life of 14 individuals, three, uh, 13 men and one woman. And now the remaining lectures, I would like to call your attention to a brief discussion of the books that were written at that time during the chaotic kingdom stage. As I said, there was some 12 books written by 11 prophets. Uh, the reason there were not 12 is that one wrote two books, Jeremiah. And these written during that time, the chaotic kingdom stage, would be Joel and Jonah, and Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and of course the smallest one, the book of Obadiah. Actually, from the chaotic kingdom stage on, there is a total of 16 writing prophets. And it might be good to stop here for just a moment or so. These prophets, and we'll discuss the office of the prophet in just a minute, uh, write to six different countries or cities. For example, of the 16 now, if you can keep this in mind from this point on now until the book of Malachi, which would include the remaining Old Testament, there are 16 total writing prophets. But uh, of the writing prophets of the 16, 11 of them write during the Chaotic Kingdom stage. But of the total 16, two write to the Northern Kingdom, minister to the Northern Kingdom. These are Amos and Hosea. And uh, these then minister to the Southern Kingdom, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then to the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, two of these prophets minister, Jonah and Nahum. And then to the city of Babylon, uh, Daniel the prophet, and to the captivities in Babylon, Ezekiel writes, and then to the city, or actually the country of Edom, Obadiah the prophet writes. So you have these prophets writing to the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, to Nineveh and Babylon, the captives in Babylon, and to Edom. Now the remaining three books in the Old Testament are not really prophetical books, but rather uh, autobiographical books, uh, books like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. These are autobiographies written by these individuals. Let me briefly now give you a summary of the office of the prophet. Of course, there are uh, three great offices that were anointed in the Old Testament, the office of the prophet, the office of the priest, and the office of a king. By the way, Jesus Christ occupies all three offices. The only individual God ever entrusted to these three was his son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. He was a prophet. A prophet is different from a priest. A prophet is one who represents God to men. In other words, a prophet is a man who says to sinful men, I have a message from God. I represent God during this particular moment, and I want you to listen to me. A priest, however, is a representative or an individual who represents men before God. So you have a prophet representing God to man and a priest representing man to God. And then, of course, a king is one who rules over man uh, as appointed by God. That is to say, if he's a good king. So our Lord occupies all three offices. He was a prophet. And for some 34 years, he wore the garb, the clothes of a prophet. In fact, when he ministered to the Galileans, they said, a great prophet hath arisen in our midst. He was a prophet. And then at the end of his life, that prophet went to the cross and then became a priest. In fact, when John the Apostle sees our Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, 
he's terrified and he falls at his feet as if he were dead. And an angel had to help him up. Now, why did the appearance of Jesus uh, so shock and overwhelm John, the apostle? He was the beloved apostle, as you remember, and he had leaned upon the bosom of Jesus. He was in the intimate three uh, relationship there, uh, G, uh, John and Peter and James. And yet when he sees him years later in the book of Revelation, he falls at his feet as if he were dead. Well, he sees him dressed not as a prophet, but as a priest. And that's what our Lord Jesus is doing right now. He was a prophet, but now for the past 2,000 years, he has been and continues today to be a priest. There used to be a, a movie that was uh, shown at late night uh, theaters on television entitled, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane? And this was a record of a Hollywood movie star, uh, sort of a little, little Shirley Temple type situation. And she grows up to be a, a mean old hag. But uh, some people ask that question today, hey, whatever happened to Jesus? My, he used to be on earth. What's he doing these days? Is he still living Yes, he surely is. He's living. He can never die. Well, where is he? Well, he's at the right hand of the Father. Is that right? What is he doing there? Well, he's a priest. The book of Hebrews tells us about the present-day ministry of Jesus. He was a prophet. He is a priest. And, of course, someday, perhaps sooner than we think, he's going to take off the garb of the priest that he's worn so effectively and so admirably for the last 20 centuries, and he's going to be fitted with his third and final suit of clothes, that of a king. And we find him mentioned in Revelation 19. He's coming dressed as the king of kings and lord of lords. So we're examining now the first of the three offices that our Lord himself actually held while he was on earth. The Hebrew word... The Old Testament for prophet is the word nabi, N-A-B-I. And it literally means to boil forth, uh, to speak with fervent speech. And the New Testament word for prophet, the Greek word, actually comes from two words. Pro means in place of, like the word pronoun. That means a pronoun is a word in place of a regular noun, regular name. And uh, phimi, P-H-E-M-I, means to speak. And so a prophet or a pro prophemy literally is one who speaks in place of something or someone else. So a prophet is one who not only boils forth, but one who speaks in the stead in the place of someone else. And so putting them together, Old and New Testament words for prophet you have one who speaks fervently the message of God as God's ambassador in God's stead. We have an example of this in Exodus 7, verse 1, where God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he allows Moses' older brother, Aaron, to be his prophet. He says, and he shall be thy prophet. In other words, Moses was slow to speak, and uh, might have even had a, a speech impairment, we do not know, impediment, I should say. And at any rate, uh, Aaron now becomes his prophet. He speaks in his place. Now, God has no speech impediment, to be sure, but God does choose men to speak for him. We are his ambassadors, we're told in the New Testament. And in a sense, this is another definition of a prophet. All right, we've already discussed this next thing on my notes here. He is different from a priest. We discussed that when we told you about the threefold offices of Christ. A priest represents men to God. A prophet represents God to men. In the Bible, Samuel is normally acknowledged as the first prophet. Now, I know even before Samuel, Moses is called a prophet, but basically, as far as the official office, apparently, in God's sight, uh, the formal recognition of the office begins with Samuel. It was Samuel that established uh, the office of the prophet, and he organized schools for the prophets. Some of these uh, prophets were 
uh, pretty backslidden and carnal prophets. We've already seen this in the days of, of uh, Ahab and the days of uh, Elijah and Elisha. But uh, he did organize these schools for the prophets in Bethel and Jericho and other places. So the duration, basically, of the office of the prophet, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, would cover a period beginning about the ninth century and closing about the fourth century. Malachi would be the last prophet in the Old Testament, and Samuel would probably be one of the first. So we have a period of about 500 years. The prophets were fiery revivalists and evangelists, and they were patriots. They were the nationalists of the day. Um, they were, for the most part, extremely unpopular. There was an exception to this, may have been more, but of all people, Jonah was one of the more popular of the prophets. He was well-liked, apparently, and I think the reason was is because of the time that he prophesied and the message that he prophesied. He prophesied to the north during the reign of Jeroboam II. I did not discuss him when we were talking about the northern kings. We did discuss Jeroboam I. He was the first ruler of the king of, of the kingdom of the north. But many years later, actually during Jonah's time, uh, there was another king, a powerful king, in fact, the most powerful of the 19 kings of the north, and he assumed the name of the first king, and so he becomes known as Jeroboam II. And it was during his reign that Jonah the prophet was ministering. In fact, he was prophesying to the northern kingdom about the same time that God spoke to him to leave that ministry and go to Nineveh and preach repentance to the Assyrians. But um, during Jeroboam II's time, it was a rather uh, prosperous time. Prosperity had uh, struck. And uh, people were experiencing a, a higher standard of life. And Jeroboam II was able, for a while at least, to consolidate the kingdom and defeat some of the enemies. And there was more money available, more jobs open. And everybody was uh, at least a little happier. And so Jonah prophesied all this would take place. And so when it did, of course, he probably became rather popular. But then God stepped in and and uh, sent him to, to Nineveh. But for the most part, these prophets were very, very unpopular. And these were not the puppy dog uh, mascots, uh, as we saw in the days of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. There was a false prophet by the name of Zedekiah, uh, who was in the pay of King Ahab, and he was a yes man. Most of these prophets, uh, for whatever else you could accuse them of, they certainly were not uh, court preachers, you know, that uh, just went along with the king, but they stood and opposed him at times, paid with their opposition with their own life. Now, the prophets in the Old Testament both were foretellers and foretellers. That is to say, they told forth concerning the sins of the day as well as foretelling. Uh, for example, let me give you a few passages in the book of Isaiah where he forth told. He told it the way it was. In Isaiah chapter 1, he says in verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished, see, in other words, I'm a prophet representing God. Now, God has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me, saith the Lord. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Now, notice in verse 5 and 6, Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. 
Folks, that is forth telling. God speaks to Isaiah, and Isaiah says, in effect, you stink concerning the nation Israel. That's forth telling the way it was in the 7th century B.C. Now, often, Isaiah, of course, foretells. He predicts the future. We can think of many passages. I think one of the most uh, precious passage in the foretelling ministry of Isaiah, of course, would be Isaiah 53. Speaking of Jesus, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here he foretells. But the point we're making is that the prophets in the Old Testament both foretold, they preached out, they thundered out against judgment concerning the sin of their day, and then they foretold. All right, um, the prophets in the Old Testament are sometimes classified, certainly erroneously, as major and minor prophets. Uh, for example, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, to name a few, are so-called major prophets, and then others like Hosea and Micah and Zephaniah are minor prophets. That is a misnomer. They're all major prophets in God's sight, and the only reason they were ever classified this way is because of the length of their content and certainly not the quality of their content. For example, the book of Jeremiah is the longest book in all the Bible, with the exception of the book of Psalms. There's more verses, more words, and uh, more letters in the book of Jeremiah than any other single book, with the exception of Psalms. And that one book, the book of Jeremiah, has more literature, or that is to say has more content in it, uh, word-wise, than the other 11 prophets do put together, uh, the minor prophets put together. So what we're trying to say, or the other, I should say, 10 minor prophets probably put together wouldn't count Jeremiah in this, of course. But uh, so the point I'm making, maybe not doing a very good job of it, is that they are called minor not because of their quality, but because of their quantity. But you have basically this classification. We've already said this, that there are 16 writing prophets, not including Samuel, who was a prophet, but we do not include his books in this list. And these prophets cover four main themes. They talk about a lot of things, but they zero in on four main themes. Number one, the first coming of Christ. Secondly, the second coming of Christ. Thirdly, the dispersion of Israel. Fourthly, the conversion of Israel. I think that's important. I want to repeat that again. They talk about four basic themes. You can take uh, all the prophets, almost everything they said, and pretty well arrange it, generally speaking, under one of these four divisions. The first coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. By the way, there's far more about the second coming in the Old Testament of Christ than there is about the first coming. Thirdly, the dispersion of Israel. Fourthly, the conversion of Israel. Now, the prophets were not told about the church age. They knew nothing about the church age. They knew about the first coming and second coming. They did not see that valley in between. And you need to know this as you study the Bible, or it really doesn't, it's sort of confusing because in some passages, for example, in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, and other passages we could call your attention to, it would seem that uh, the prophet puts the first and second coming in the same verse, and he does. And you wonder, well, what's the situation here? Well, let me tell you, they saw these with a far-off telescope, and I remember, by way of illustration, now the things they saw, I'm talking about the first and second coming of Christ. I remember the first time we went out west as a family, my father and mother and my brother and two sisters, and it was in the early 50s. And 
And um, I'd really never been out of Illinois until that time, and it was quite a trip. And so uh, we got on Highway 66, of course, and made our way. And finally, we, uh, we came into Denver, Colorado. And on the outskirts of Denver, you begin to see the Rocky Mountains for the first time. And uh, I had never seen anything like that, and I was just, just awed and, and uh, overwhelmed with the majesty of these Rockies. And I remember seeing two gigantic mountains, and they looked like they were back to back. And uh, I was uh, looking forward to uh, being in the car when we went over these mountains. And when we crossed the first of these two mountains that I had seen from a distance of about 50 miles, we finally got up there, uh, I saw, to my amazement, there was a valley in between or a long stretch of road, uh, 40 or 50 miles. Now, from uh, a distance... They seemed like they were back to back, one mountain, and then immediately after that, the next mountain. Well, you see, uh, this is the way the prophets viewed the first and second coming of Christ. Uh, they sort of picture them as back to back. He would come the first time and grow up, and, and uh, then uh, after suffering and dying, although they didn't completely understand about this either, and yet Isaiah 53 did speak about it, uh, he would suddenly then uh, take to himself the theocratical millennial kingdom. And immediately after his first coming, or shortly after his first coming, they some of them assumed, I imagine, that, uh, you know, the millennial kingdom will be instituted and the lion will lay down with the lamb and the little child will play over the whole of the cockatrice den and and all the nations would come to Jerusalem to become the center of the world. Well, it didn't happen that way because of the church age in between. They did not, they were not told about that. Another thing about the prophets, the prophets did not often understand fully what they wrote about. Now, it had nothing to do with inspiration. They wrote it down correctly, but they didn't always understand what they wrote down correctly. And we know that to be a fact. First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, speak about this. And he's talking about our great salvation. And Peter says, and I quote, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you, which things the angels desire to look into. In other words, they didn't always understand, often did not understand exactly what they wrote about. Uh, to give you an example of this, take, for example, Isaiah 53. I read a book some time ago, it was a number of years ago, and I can't remember the author, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was written by, a, I believe, a Jewish scholar, and he discusses some of the theological, or he speculates, I should say, about some of the theological discussions that must have gone on in the days of uh, Isaiah's time when the the rabbis and the uh, theologues, as we call the students uh, studying theology, the theologians of the day, concerning the interpretation of Isaiah 53. Now, uh, that was a very difficult chapter for them if they indeed did accept that chapter as speaking of the coming Messiah. You see, some of them did not. Some Jews still feel it doesn't even speak about the Messiah. It speaks about uh, the nation Israel suffering. But assuming it talked about the coming Messiah, then they would say, we have a problem here. We understand the necessity of a lamb being offered and maybe even God sending a son. And they knew something about Bethlehem because of Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the prophet. They knew nothing about, they knew something about the virgin birth because of the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah 7. But what about this problem in Isaiah 53 of this... Uh, of this suffering Savior dying, now how in the world can he be our king if he dies? If he is given as a sacrifice, how can he be that and still be a sovereign? So according to this Jewish scholar, whose name I cannot remember, or book, uh, the name of the title, he said that uh, there was a, a theory among some of the theologians of the day that the virgin 
according to Isaiah 9, who would be the mother of the Messiah, would actually give birth to twins. And one of these twins would grow up and suffer for the sins of Israel, act as God's two-legged lamb, and shed his blood, and that the other son of this woman, the other twin, then would grow up to become the, the sovereign ruler and to usher in the millennium. You see, they could not understand, of course, how that the same person could do both, but he wouldn't do both at the same time. They did not understand that uh, the Virgin Mary would give birth to both a lamb and a lion. The lamb would come first and die for the sins of the world and be resurrected, go back to heaven, and then someday the lion would come. But the lamb is still the lion, and the lion is still the lamb. In Revelation chapter 5, we have a remarkable chapter of John the Apostle weeping. And he weeps because no man was able to come forward and take the title deed of the earth and purify it through the seals, the judgment seals, and usher in the millennium. And no man was able to do that. And then one of the elders said, Weep not, for behold... The lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. He's able to do that. And John turns, and I guess he expects to see a lion, but he says, And I turn, and lo, a lamb was in the midst of the elders, and he came forward and took the lamb. So the prophets did not understand the lamb-lion identity relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, this passage written by Simon Peter pretty well concerning the prophets and everything summarizes the first and second coming of Christ, does it not? Speaking, the Bible says uh, they did not understand at what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when he testified beforehand. Now notice, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That, my friend, is a summary of the Bible. The sufferings of Christ, that's the first coming, that's the Lamb part, and the glory that should follow, that's the second coming, that's the Lion part. And um, the first Resurrection Sunday, our Lord Jesus himself reemphasized this, this thought. He spoke to two disciples on the route, road to Emmaus, and they did not recognize him as Jesus, but they were blue and, and discouraged and downhearted because their Messiah had been crucified. They had no hope for his resurrection. And our Lord says to these two discouraged disciples, Then said he unto them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But again, notice Jesus' statement. Ought not Christ, says about himself, to have suffered these things? Now that's the lamb bit that's the first coming, and to enter into his glory, that's the second coming of Christ, that's the lion bit. The next thing about the prophets, two other thoughts about them, I hope we've briefly, but, uh, uh, comple well, not completely, but sufficiently, I suppose I want to say, summarize the office of the prophet in your hearing. Two other thoughts the prophets are compared to as watchmen on the wall in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk. Uh, they picture themselves as watchmen on the wall, the moral wall of the north and south during their days. And then the final statement, both, and I did not realize this until I really got into a study of this recently, both the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities were caused in part by the lying ministries 
of false prophets. We read that in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 13, 14, 21, and 22. So you need to turn to Jeremiah 23 sometime and read this. Were it not for the lying ministries of false prophets, uh, then uh, perhaps God could have worked out another plan for the Old Testament. We do not know those things. But the thing is this, that I've been sort of fussing with the kings of Israel. And, uh, you know, as we had showed you some ungodly priests also. But, but here the Bible speaks of the false prophets that helped to uh, hasten on the Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. All right. Now we want to begin the study of the books that the prophets wrote. The first one is the prophet Obadiah. Obadiah is the smallest and shortest Old Testament book. It has only 21 verses. Obadiah, we're not sure when he wrote. In my list, I put him at the first of the prophets, writing in around 848 B.C., and uh, other lists, you'll have him at the end of the list. So some put him in the 8th century, some the 7th, some the 6th, and some in the 5th century. And you can find uh, qualified scholars wherever you want to uh, put him, but I'm putting him for at least uh, purposes today in uh, the 8th century. Uh, Obadiah has but one theme, and that's the destruction of the nation Edom. The Edomites lived in the high, inaccessible, mountainous cliffs south of the Dead Sea, and their capital was Petra. My opportunity to visit Petra on three different occasions. It's a city completely walled in by high mountains ranging from 1,000 to 1,200 feet high, and there's only one narrow passageway leading into the city of Petra. It's called the Red Rose City, not only because of the the uh, flowers that bloom there, but because of the red hue in the rock. And it's a, it's a beautifully desolate, if you can add those two words together, city. And so Petra seemed to be the capital of the Edomite nation. And the reason I write this is because apparently uh, Obadiah has reference to these folks who were living at that time in Petra because they were uh, high as far as their uh, homes were concerned. They had uh, burrowed into the mountainous cliffs, and uh, uh, he mentions that in his book, the book of Obadiah. Now, a great hatred had developed, of course, between the Is- Israelis and the Edomites, uh, even though uh, they were related Edom was the people that Esau founded, of course, and Israel was the nation founded by Jacob, who was the twin brother of Esau. So actually they were very close blood brothers. But this feud began, I suppose, in Genesis 27, uh, when uh, Esau felt that his brother, uh, had uh, Jacob, had cheated him out of his birthright. And later on, During the Exodus in Numbers chapter 20, the Exodus period, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, refused passage to Moses leading the Israelis. And they wouldn't let them come through the land of Eden, so that meant they had to wander an additional 100, 120 miles in the desert. And Israel did not forget that. Later on, also after this, when they got in the land, King Saul tribe of Benjamin, of course, an Israelite, would fight against them, and David subdued them. So they hated Israel. Now, the Edomites were noted for their wise men. In fact, Eliapaz, one of the wise men in the book of Job, was from the city of Teman, according to Job chapter 2, Job chapter 3, rather, And uh, this was a city in Edom. In fact, uh, Obadiah mentions the wise men of the city. And God is now going to judge them. And really, this is, as I say, the only theme of the book of Obadiah, the destruction 
of Edom. Obadiah actually says this, boy, are you going to get it? That's really what he's saying. God's going to judge them because of two things. Number one, because of their thankless hearts. And secondly, because of their treacherous hands. Their thankless hearts. They had arrogance running out their ears. In verse 2 of this one chapter in the book of Obadiah, God says, Behold, I have made thee small among the nations. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou who dwellest in the cleft of the rock. See, they're probably hiding out here or living in Petra. Whose habitation is high. You live way up among the birds. Who saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Well, God says in verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself like the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, from there will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So God's going to judge them because of their thankless hearts, because of their pride. And the second reason he's going to judge them is because not only of their thankless hearts, but their treacherous hands. Actually, what happened, and we don't know exactly the time this happened, but on occasion, the city of Jerusalem and other Israeli cities were confronted and invaded, suffered invasion from various other nations, not only the Assyrians and Babylonians, but on occasion the the Egyptians and the Philistines and the rest. And every time Israel got into trouble from its neighbors or some invasion uh, from an alien power, the Edomites were there to edge them on, that is to say, uh, to uh, encourage the enemies. And when the Israelite people attempted to escape, Edomites would usually cut them off and either kill them or drive them back to to Jerusalem, or often they would simply capture them and then sell them into slavery to that particular nation that happened to come down at that given time. And um, God speaks about this in verse 10. He said, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, which would be the other side of... uh, of the Jordan River, the other side of the Dead Sea, or below the Dead Sea, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Why, God said, you would think that you'd have no, uh, that, that you weren't r- uh, related to the Israel- Israelis at all, when in fact, of course, they were. And he said, you acted as if you were the, among the enemies of Jerusalem. Verse 12, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Uh, that is to say, when he suffered reproach from his enemies. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Israel in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Verse 14, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway. See, that's what I said, in the crossroads there, and they prevented them from escaping. To cut off those of his, the Israelis, that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. And so because of what they had done, they were going to be destroyed. Well, in 312 B.C., they were displaced by an Arabian race of people called the Nabeatans. And in the Sinai Peninsula and also in the uh, city of Petra today, you can find carved uh, records and writings from the Nabeatans Uh, concerning their lifestyle, but at any rate, the Nabeatans entered the city of Petra and other Edomite cities, and by the year 312 B.C., three centuries before Christ, the Edomites had been completely driven out of their cities, especially Petra, and uh, so they don't have anywhere else to go, so they go to Palestine and take up uh, living there, 
and they were conquered then by the Jews during the Maccabean period and uh, subdued. Now, years later, during the time of Christ, we learn, we read about an Edomite. His name was Herod. And, uh, of course, his uh, member of his family, uh, not only King Herod, the one that tried to kill Jesus, but later on, a relative of that same King Herod, another Herod, was one who uh, tried Jesus during the unfair trials that he had. And so thus in Luke 23, Jacob's most famous son, someday uh, someone stood, I'm sorry, let me go back and say that, someone has said that in Luke 23, Jacob's most famous son stood before Esau's most famous son. Jesus stands before Herod. Well, along with the Jews, the Edomites were destroyed due to the rebellion by Titus in 70 A.D. The Jews uh, rebelled against the Romans in 70 A.D., as you know from Bible history, or from uh, secular history, rather, and uh, the Edomites did this also, and they were both destroyed. Um, one final thing. Many believe that Petra will be the hiding place of a remnant of Israeli people during the Great Tribulation. You have probably by this time listened to the tapes on the doctrine of prophecy, one of the first uh, doctrinal studies that we considered, and uh, you know some of the arguments for that. But it is interesting to note that uh, Petra, the city, will, and Edom itself, the country where Edom used to occupy, will escape the control of the Antichrist during the tribulation. He won't, for some reason, he'll control the Middle East, but he won't control that. Wouldn't it be ironical if that be the case? Uh, the very headquarters of the uh, hated enemies of Israel, the Edomites, are now not only non-existent as a nation or a people, but their very capital, former capital city, may someday become the sanctuary and the hiding place of the descendants of Jacob during the tribulation. So much now for the first of the minor prophets, the book of Obadiah. We'll continue on the remaining tapes, these other uh, studies.